people do. It seems I'm getting a little pushback from fellow Australians who believe we have a right to protest in Australia as a direct result of telling Tommy in our conversation that we don't have a right to protest in Australia. And so, while this video is expressly for Australians who are breaking the law and don't even know that they are, because, as we all understand implicitly, ignorance of the law is not a valid defence, it's also informational for Americans whose states might be enshrining into law limitations on protests and what language to look out for that covers all protests even though you might think it only covers a specific type of protest that you personally may not be interested in. And for our fellow Australians who might ask, well, what authority are you speaking from, Aussie? Or for newcomers to the channel who don't know my background very well at this point, you may be well aware that I have a degree in software engineering, but you may not be aware that commercial law is a core component of that subject. Commercial law or business law is focused on the laws that businesses must abide by, both nationally and internationally. More recently, just a few years ago, I studied the topic of justice at Harvard University, which gives you the philosophical evolution of justice as we know it today and how it operates in modern societies. And from there, I went on to study international law at UC Louvain in France, where I stopped short of graduating because, well, let's just say there are some aspects of international law which conflict with my own moral values, but that is a story for another day. Today, I would just like to help my fellow Australians understand the current state of our rights to protest in Australia and what forms of protests have been criminalised and how that impacts other forms of protest. Because I would hate for any of you to be caught up in the legal quagmire of having to fight your way to the high courts to defend yourselves. So let's start with a document produced by a number of organisations in Australia who have been trying to protect our right to protest failing, obviously, but they do produce this report. I think it's every year. It might be less often than that. However, this is the 2024 report, so it's covering all of the current legislations. So I'm going to begin with where we get our misconception from that we have a right to protest, and primarily it comes from international law. As I go through this, you'll understand a little bit more clearly why some of this conflicted with my moral values. Under international law, every country who is a member of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights is supposedly covered by the right to peaceful assembly. Now, I'll just zoom in on this so you can see the little bit that I'm going to read. The right to peaceful assembly, by definition, cannot be exercised using violence. Violence at international law is deemed to entail the use of physical force against others that is likely to result in injury or death or cause serious damage to property. Mere pushing, shoving, direct action, civil disobedience or the temporary disruption to roads, cars, pedestrians or of daily activities does not on its own amount to violence. Isolated acts of violence may not necessarily render an entire assembly as violent. Importantly, violence that renders an assembly non-peaceful must originate from participants of the assembly. This ensures that peaceful assemblies are protected from the violent action of the authorities, agents, provocateurs, or counter-demonstrators. These are very important notes. Under international law, what our government, or what our state governments, currently call violence doesn't fit into the international law definition. So, the right to protest under common law. Common law has recognised the right to assembly as far back as 
1215 and in Australia, courts regard it a core part of a democratic system of government. However, common law freedoms only apply insofar as they are not overridden by parliamentary laws or for those who don't have parliament's federal laws. The High Court, or for those who don't have High Courts, the Supreme Court, has deliberated on the conditional nature of these freedoms in Lang versus Australian Broadcasting Corporation. It says, under a legal system based on the common law, everybody is free to do anything subject only to the provisions of the law. I believe there is also some biblical element to abiding by the laws of the land that you currently reside in. So that one proceeds upon an assumption of freedom of speech and turns to the law to discover the established expectations to it. The right to protest under the Australian Constitution. It is not expressly stated in our Constitution that we have a right to protest. What is stated in our Constitution is the right of political communication. If you can bring your case to a high court, which costs at least a million dollars or more, I'm sure we can get some more information on that, but it costs a lot of money to get your case up to a high court, they will generally rule as it says here, by legal precedents in Brown versus Tasmania, the implied freedom protects the free expression of political opinion, including peaceful protest, which is indispensable to the exercise of political sovereignty by the people of the Commonwealth. It's basically saying it's implied, it is not expressed in any of our legal doctrines. And most of you be well aware we do not have a human rights bill outside of our constitution. The right to protest in statute, that's regarding to federal laws and state laws. Queensland does have um, a Peaceful Assembly Act, however the wording of that is ambiguous. So if they decide to slap you with a fine, it is because of this ambiguous wording. Protection of the right to protest in domestic law. Some laws, some states, have human rights charters, which is only applicable to the state. But currently Victoria and Queensland are the only two that provides that the right to assemble peacefully is subject only to such restrictions as are necessary and reasonable in a democratic society in the interests of public safety, public order, or the protection of the rights and freedoms of other persons. Public order is a very important thing here because this is, if you're disruptive, like you're yelling and making a noise, which protests often involve, then that's excluded, essentially. Public safety, if it's putting the public safety at risk now, one of the things that they say that falls into public safety, for example, is the tent embassy. For those who aren't familiar, the indigenous people put their tents up, used to put their tents up on the lawn, front lawn at Canberra House, which is where our national assembly of politicians operate from, essentially. Um, but under public safety, apparently those tents pose a threat. So they're not allowed to pitch their tents anymore on the front lawn. This is just one small example of how it seems perfectly reasonable that public safety would come first, but how does a tent threaten public safety? I believe it also falls under some sort of environmental law, like uh, destruction of the environment, which is, you know, a bit of a contradiction when you consider that all of the states are currently involved in heavily logging ancient forests, but that's beside the point. We actually come back to that point eventually, so... Okay, as far as limiting the right to protest, again, it comes from um, articles in the Convention of the United Nations, so let's talk about that for one second. 
the United Nations covenants or contracts that we are signatories to essentially exclude articles and provisions that are in contradiction with the country's current traditions or values. So things that we have always done in the past, if there's an article or a provision that says you can't do that, we've always done it so we're allowed to continue doing it. And this is how we get around being a signatory to many of these contracts and still break the articles or provisions provided in those contracts. There is, um, that's these two, must be in conformity with the law. So if, if a state or federal law is in place that overrides an article in human rights law, then that cancels out human rights law. This is the same sort of thing. Limitations must be necessary in a democratic society. Australia's got a whole other standard of what they call a democratic society to what you guys might call that. <laughs> limitations on national security grounds, probably the only one that we will probably all agree on, uh, and limitation on public safety grounds. And this is where things get a little murky because you might read, oh, those animal activists can't stand them. They shouldn't be allowed to do that. But then you find the way that the law is written, it also includes other types of activism that you actually might want to engage in. There's also public order grounds. We all just went through that in 2020. Limitations for the protection of public health. Again, we all went through that in 2020, where we weren't even allowed to travel interstate without a pass, uh, which was very reminiscent of another world war that we won't mention. Limitations for the protection of morals. How, how broad is that? Whose morals? I have morals that don't actually align with any of this stuff. <laughs> so whose morals are we talking about? Um, this ground, if used at all, should not be used to protect understandings of morality from a single social, philosophical or religious tradition. Any restriction imposed for the protection of morals must be understood in the light of pluralism non-discrimination and the universality of human rights. Limitations on the right to protest should only exceptionally be imposed in the name of protecting morals. So that group is essentially what we would call a branch of philosophy that encapsulates for the greater good. And so this is this is a philosophy coined by John Locke. He was a, an English philosopher who's known for empiricalism and political liberalism, classic liberalism, not today's current liberalists, leftists. We're talking about a different thing altogether. It's a little L, <laughs> not a capital L, meaning it's describing a set of characteristics related to the common good and not the capital L naming of a political party or political affiliation. So don't freak out because you hear that word. <laughs> they have two different meanings. Uh, limitation to, pro to protect the rights and freedom of others. Again, this is a very broad brushstroke that could include a whole bunch of things. Um, you can see here, for example, some Australian states and territories have introduced safe access zones for people accessing reproductive health services. These laws limit protests outside of those specific types of places to protect and promote people's access to health in privacy and dignity. So you might be for or against that particular law, but the way it's worded is so broad that it's probably going to impact something else that you would like to protest. So um, the last thing there is uh, 
In some instances, a law limiting a particular message or idea is required if the limitation is lawful, necessary, proportionate and justifiable in a democratic society. Again, each state has their own idea of what that is. Under international law, the right to protest can be limited if it is being used as propaganda for war or if it is used for the advocacy of national, racial or religious hatred that incites people to discrimination, hostility or violence. Again, hostility and violence is very broad. It's not entirely defined so that it can be applied uh, with an even hand. Now, what we would like to do is get to some examples. Um, so we do have federal government laws that override state laws. So our constitution expressly says when a law of the state is in conflict with the law of the, gov the, the federal government, then the federal government's law prevails. I'm pretty sure American law is very similar. So let's get down to what federal law covers. So we're starting with the Criminal Code Amendment of 2019. They introduced two new offences relating to using communication services such as phone, social media, text, to encourage property crimes or trespassing on agricultural land. Now, they were introduced and sold to the public as prevention of animal rights groups activism, specifically Aussie farms, whose stated objective is to end commercialise animal abuse and exploitation in Australian animal agricultural facilities. But it's actually a lot broader than that. So they used that concept to get Australians to go, you know, we don't want those sort of protests. But then they worded it ambiguously so that you cannot, well, even farmers can't even protest. It was the Morrison government that pledged to make it illegal to use the internet to share personal information that could encourage trespassing on farms, punishable by up to 12 months in jail. So like I said, it depends who's in power as to what we're calling anti-democratic. We also have a... Building and Construction Industry Act, which makes it illegal to plan or take part in unlawful pickets in the construction industry. An unlawful picket was described as any action aimed at stopping or limiting someone from entering or leaving a building or related site if it is done to push for better employment conditions for workers in the construction industry. So this is against workers' unions, basically. It's a maximum fine for businesses to do this for three, up to $300,000. A maximum fine for just you and me for attending a rally like that of $60,000. So it's good to be aware that you might go, oh, it's a union protest, I'm going to that, and then find out that you actually are liable under the federal government for a fine. The Criminal Code Amendment in 2019, this law made it illegal to use phone or internet services, including social media, to en encourage people, meaning organise a protest, to trespass or commit crimes on farms or agricultural land. Um, again, this is the same act we were talking about here. Using a carriage service to incite trespass on agricultural lands, 12 months in jail for organising a protest on a farm or agricultural land, using a carriage service for inciting property damage or theft, five years imprisonment. So we don't have any animal rights activists doing that stuff anymore. When the authorities limit the right to protest, they need to prove that restrictions are necessary, legal and proportional to at least one valid reason listed in Article 21 of the ICCPR. And we can't say, well, traditionally we've always done this because it's traditionally never been written into law before. <laughs> when the Morrison Liberal National Government presented this law in Parliament, 
They justified it by saying it was to safeguard public safety and property rights. Like I said, broad brush stroke, right? However, in potential contravention of Article 21 of the International Human Rights Act, it was irrelevant to the offence if any detriment to business or safety actually occurred. So that is the federal government. Oh, hang on, we got some more. Moving on, we have protection of Australian flags, um, desecration of a flag, meaning you can't destroy an Australian flag, and if you do, you are going to be fined $30,000 or more. Migration Amendment. This bill aimed to change the Migration Act to establish rules for when authorised officers in immigration detention centres can use force to, among other things, ensure the order of immigration detention facilities, including to quell protests. An example of that is uh, several facilities where we export our immigrant, our so-called illegal immigrants to Nauru, PNG. No one's allowed to protest there. And if any employees leak what's going on there, they are actually subject to jail and all sorts of things. Criminal Code Amendment inciting illegal disruptive activities. Hmm. Disruptive activities. Disruptive is when you're yelling and waving your sign around, right? So, it covers a lot of things. This bill aimed to change the Criminal Code Act to introduce three new offences using communication services like social media phones or the internet to encourage protests essentially they say trespass property damage or theft or the obstruction of roads it's essentially saying you're not allowed to protest in a public road so they're starting to narrow down you know public protests and where they can actually be held not just what they can be held for using carriage service to incite trespasses 12 months imprisonment Using a carriage service to incite property damage or theft is a five month imprisonment and using a carriage service for inciting unlawful obstruction of roads is also a 12 month imprisonment. Protests are a legitimate use of public and other spaces even if they cause disruptions to traffic or pedestrians. If the disruptions become too difficult for authorities to manage, restrictions on protests can be imposed on a case-by-case -case basis. Authorities must demonstrate that any restrictions are compatible with human rights law. This requirement was not met with this bill and it was introduced into the Parliament anyway. I did mention the tent embassy. They broke the laws of public safety and the Environmental Act, so they're no longer there. Um, and the reason I say that is because this is Canberra. So the ACT is where Parliament House is. It's where all the politicians work from. And this particular tent embassy was on the front lawn of Parliament House. The Australian Capital Territory, territory is a state within a state. So it's, it's actually inside of New South Wales, but it's its own state. So they can make laws for parliamentary sort of residential areas that are not applicable to New South Wales, the wider state that it's parked in the middle of. It's confusing, I know, but <laughs> that's where we are. All right, so in New South Wales, the recent developments here, the Roads and Crimes Re Legislation Amendment, these are all criminal, by the way. These are not misdemeanours. These are criminal, um, mostly criminal that we've covered so far. The Road and Crimes Act inserted Section 214A into the Crimes Act to criminalise damage or disruption to a major facility. What's a major facility? And is it public? Because we all have the right to publicly assemble in public facilities.
where previous legislation covered disruption on major bridges or tunnels, train stations, ports and public and private infrastructure, while also providing for significant penalties for breaches, these new measures were introduced to target climate defenders. However, the laws were so broad and vague that in effect they threaten anyone protesting in a public space with up to two years in jail and up to a $22,000 fine if they do so without a permit. And that is what I was talking about on Tommy's channel. You need to have a permit. So if you attend a rally, you don't know whether the person who organised that rally had a permit. You don't know if they organise it over social media or by phone. All of them are criminal acts and you attending it as an individual could land you in jail for two years. This is New South Wales. So there has been a challenge. In December there was a challenge to this new law in the High Courts sorry, in the Supreme Court of New South Wales. So um, the High Courts is federal all over the country and it defends the Constitution, whereas the Supreme Court is the highest court of the state. So the Supreme Court of New South Wales declared parts of Section 124A of the Crimes Act to be invalid because it impermissibly burdened the implied freedom of political communication. In its decision, the court reaffirmed the position that the environmental protests constitute political communication. The court concluded that there was a real prospect that Section 214A could impact on various methods of political communication and that the burden is potentially substantial and direct. The state of New South Wales contended that it did not burden the implied freedom because the conduct it sought to prohibit was already unlawful. The court found that the state of New South Wales did not prove that the conduct prohibited so far as the partial closure of a facility is concerned and subsection 1D which concerns people being directed away from a major facility due to it being obstructed, obstructed or damaged was already unlawful. The court declared that so far as the provision criminalises conduct that causes the closure of part of a major facility, blah, blah, blah. It impermissibly burdened the implied freedom of political communication contrary to the Constitution and therefore is invalid. There is actually a Latin term that describes an invalid law, a law that is passed without the power to pass it, and it's called ultra vires. And so essentially, the Supreme Court of New South Wales deemed this new law ultra vires. And here's the problem. Even though New South Wales Supreme Court said, no, this law is ultra vires, it is without power, it's still in effect. If you were to be fined under that law or charged under that law, you would have to fight your way through magistrates, criminal, up to Supreme Court, in order to have a ruling in your favour, because it's still in effect. They say it will be reviewed, but, you know, it will, we, we shall see. Um, so the union's comment saying, you know, we basically prevented sweatshops by being able to protest our rights, and, you know, the reason we don't have sweatshops anymore, uh, like other countries do, is because we were able to protest those particular things. So, but there seems to feel like a real crackdown happening on unions, even though that is their history. Law enforcement, powers and responsibilities. This law sets out many of the powers and responsibilities of the police in relation to dispersing assembled groups and issuing move on orders. It also sets out offences for non-compliance with a police direction. Refusing or failing to comply with a police erection to disperse. Minimum fine, 
refusing or failing to comply with police direction to move on, maximum fine of $220. The issue with this law is that a lawful peaceful protest can be made unlawful where there is any level of traffic obstruction subject to broad discretion by police. To ensure that police act appropriately when relying on this law, they should receive proper training on its operation as well as comprehensive human rights training more broadly, which none of them do. Um, I hopefully did point out we're in ACT, which is the little tiny state inside of New South Wales. So it's not, it's, it's a state law inside of the ACT. It makes things very confusing, I know, but I'm sorry. Don't shoot the messenger. World Youth Day Act. This law was introduced ahead of the Pope's visit for World Youth Day. It made it a crime to enter roads that were closed for the event, uh, but I believe it's still in it's still in effect, even though he's been and gone and this was way decades ago. Offences relating to road closures, $5,000. Offences relating to distribution of articles, $5,000. Failure to comply to a direction without reasonable excuse, $5,500. It is common for parliaments to pass laws to facilitate major events. Often these laws impose restricted access zones, increase policing powers, ban protests in some areas, or ban displaying the signs or other articles. This law gave broad search powers to police while also imposing while also imposing fines for broad and vague offences like causing annoyance or inconvenience to participants it's still in effect the major events act this law made it illegal to enter roads that are closed to vehicles or pedestrians during major, major events Offences related to the road closures is a maximum fine of $3,500. This law appears disproportionate in its blanket ban. Any laws introduced for or around major events must still be compatible with the human rights law and carefully balance security concerns with the rights of protesters and their ability to use public space. Forestry Act, this law establishes rules for dedicating, managing and using state forests and crown timber land. Crown timber land means the government took it into their own possession and are logging it. It also made it illegal to obstruct or hinder forestry, i.e. the logging of forests. Refusing or failing to answer questions of an authorised officer, two and a half, uh, sorry, 2,200 obstructing, delaying or hindering an authorised officer, maximum fine of 2200 And these are not just under the Forestry Act. These, these have actually fallen under quite a number of acts within different states as well. This law prioritises forestry operations over the right of people's access to public land. So they made it crown timber land so they could log it, that also makes it public land, which also means that we have access to it. Enclosed Crimes and Law Enforcement Legislation. This law introduced an aggravated offence of trespassing on enclosed land on which any business or undertaking is conducted if while doing so, someone interferes with a business or undertaking. This law gave police the ability to search people or their vehicles as well as seize items without a warrant if a police officer suspects that a person may be seeking to interfere with a business or undertaking. Aggravated unlawful entry maximum fine of five and a half thousand dollars. This law does not define interference with. Again, it's ambiguous, it could apply to anything, but the standard appears lower than that required at international law. It is also overly broad in its application to enclosed lands and what they actually are, which include prescribed premises as well as any land surrounded in whole or in part by a fence, wall, river or cliff. Very broad. I'm going to try and get through these a little quicker, but we're almost done.
the right to farm. This law amended the enclosed lands protection to increase penalties for offences on agricultural lands and for trespass on farms. Again, this is related to animal rights activists. $13,000 fine or imprisonment for 12 months or both. And if when committing an offence someone is accompanied by two or more people and they cause a serious risk to the safety of people on the land, maximum fine of $22,000 or imprisonment for up to three years or both. Roads and Crimes Legislation Amendment 2022. This law created offences for behaviour that causes damage or disruption to major roads, a major public facility or without a lawful excuse. It also created a new offence of causing disruption to any prescribed tunnel, road, bridge or railway stations, ports or infrastructure facilities without a lawful excuse, maximum fine of up to $22,000 imprisonment or imprisonment for up to two years or both. Northern Territory Justice Legislation Amendment Group This law made an offence to loiter in a public place after being given notice by a police officer to leave after certain conditions are met. Under this law, loiter is taken to mean idle or linger about. Maximum fine $17,600 or imprisonment for up to six months. This law defines loitering very broadly and gives the police broad discretion to move people on when engaging in peaceful protests. Queensland. Oh, this one's this one's so silly. The Dangerous Devices Act was introduced to the Queensland Parliament following a series of high-profile protest actions by climate defenders. The Act's explanatory memorandum also noted that animal welfare advocates and people protesting against coal mining were also its targets. The Act criminalises the use of several devices, which are common feature of pe peaceful protests such as monopoles, sleeping dragons and tripods even when the devices are used in a way that causes minimal disruption. Under the Act protesters who use these devices in a way that prevents a person from entering a shop or who disrupt mining equipment for as little as 10 minutes could face prison terms of up to one year. The Act also enables police to bypass the usual court processes by issuing on-the-spot fines. The Act's provisions are broad and vague with key terms such as unreasonably interfere and reasonable excuse are not clearly defined. In seeking to justify the legislation, the Queensland Government labelled Extinction Rebellion protesters as extremists who use sinister tactics. The then Premier also told Parliament that lock-on devices in Queensland were being laced with traps such as glass fragments and butane gas containers, but refused to provide any evidence in support of the claims. G20 This all stopped being in effect the day after the end of the G20 summit. Summary Offences and Other Legislations Amendment This law changed the Peace and Good Behaviour Act for Queensland. It allowed commissioned police officers and courts to issue public safety orders. These orders can stop individuals or groups from going to certain places or events if their presence is a serious threat to public safety or security. Failure to comply with an order, maximum fine of $46,000 or up to three years imprisonment. The Queensland Law Society argued that the powers to create safety orders should be limited to courts and not police officers and that the laws did not properly protect the right to protest or undertake industrial action. Agriculture and Other Legislation Amendment Bill The law included amendments to summary offences to change the definition of unlawful assembly to specifically include assemblies on various types of ag agricultural land. If assembly is enshrined 
even if it's implied in our constitution, then it can't be unlawful. Anything that declares it unlawful is in contradiction with the constitution and therefore ultra virus. A group causing fear or posing a risk to the health and safety of people or animals, maximum fine 1500 bucks or up to two years imprisonment. Remaining on a farm or agricultural land or food production facility, maximum fine of $3,000 or up to 12 months imprisonment. It is overly broad because it criminalises peaceful protests. For instance, it would capture farm workers protesting for better working conditions on or near the workplaces. South Australia. On May... 18th 2023 the South Australian Parliament passed the summary offences amendment in response to protests during a major oil and gas conference in Adelaide the obstruction of public places act amended section 58 to dramatically increase the maximum penalty for directly and indirectly obstructing a place from a maximum fine of 750 to a maximum fine of $50,000 or a term of imprisonment for up to three months. This amounted to a 60-fold increase to the maximum penalty. Protesters caught by the new laws could also be liable for paying the cost of law enforcement and other emergency service personnel called to the scene. The Act also made the offence of obstructing a public place easier to establish. Previously, to establish the offence of blocking a public place, the conduct had to be willful. Under the new laws, the blocking of a public place would not have to be intentional or reckless. So you could just be wandering through and the cops can slap the cuffs on you and fine you for 50 grand. Only one amendment to the laws was made in the upper house. The amendment removed the element of recklessness to establish the offence, which would have disproportionately criminalised a wide range of legitimate public conduct. These laws continue to be excessive, their constitutional validity is yet to be tested. Because nobody can afford to take it to the High Court. Summary offences. This law gave police officers the authority to compel people or groups within a declared public precinct to leave if the officer determines they pose a threat to public order or safety. Additionally, it empowered police to use force to remove people who refuse to comply with a directive to leave. This law also made it a crime for a person or group to not leave a declared public precinct or to re-enter or try to re-enter a declared public precinct. Maximum fine of $1,250. Summary Offences Amendment. This law dramatically increases the maximum penalty, which we just discussed, up to $50,000. Tasmania. Dr. Bob Brown and Miss Jessica Hoyt were arrested and charged under the Workplaces Protection from Protesters Act. Brown and Hoyt were arrested after entering Laponia State Forest in Tasmania to raise public and political awareness about the logging of the forest. The Protection from Protesters Act made it an offence to not leave a forestry area when directed to do so by police, and both were charged under this provision. Brown and Hoyt commenced proceedings in the High Court to challenge the constitutional validity of the Protection from, Prote from Protesters Act, arguing it impermissibly restricted the implied freedom of political communication. Although the state of Tasmania dropped the charges after the proceedings had commenced, the High Court ruled that the plaintiffs had a real interest in the validity of the laws to understand whether or not the public were required to observe them. The High Court, in a 6-1 to one majority, held that the measures adopted by the Protection from Protesters Act to deter protesters imposed a significant and disproportionate burden 
on the freedom of political communication and were therefore unconstitutional. In March of 2021, the Workplaces Protection from Protesters Bill, a law which purported to respond to the High Court's ruling in Brown, but which also could have criminalised people for conduct like handing out flyers on a footpath, was voted down by the Tasmanian Legislative Council after being criticised as broad and unnecessary. In the introduction and passing of that Act is the Tasmanian Government's most recent attempt to legislate unnecessary and disproportionate restrictions on people's right to peaceful advocacy following the High Court decision in Brown. The Police Offences Amendment. The Rockliffe Liberal Government passed this Act, which amended a previous Act in 2022. These laws continue to undermine Tasmania's democratic values and Tasmania's fundamental right to protest. Under this law, a person who obstructs access to a workplace as part of a protest could face up to 12 months in prison or a fine of up to $9,750. Similarly, if an organisation supports members of the community to stage a protest, the organisation could be fined up to $48,750. Also in Tasmania, we have a law that substantially restricted the rights to protest in Tasmania by introducing provisions that prohibited protesters from taking actions that will prevent, hinder or obstruct business activities. And it also gave the police sweeping powers, obstructing the use of enjoyment of a public thoroughfare, $5,000, threatening to impede a business activity, $5,000, impeding a police officer, $100,000, removing or damaging a sign indicating a demarcated business premises, maximum fine of $2,000. Police Offences Amendment Act. This law repealed the Protection for Protesters Act and made amendments for the police to clarify the operations of provisions relating to unlawful entry to land. This also clarified that a person who attaches themselves to land, buildings, structures or premises can be considered to be trespassing while they are attached. While committing this sort of offence, $48,000 fine for businesses and 10000 for individuals or up to 12 months imprisonment. Um, while committing the offence, up to $10,000 or 18 months imprisonment for a first offence and then a maximum fine of $15,000 or imprisonment for up to 24 months for any subsequent offences. Workplace safety, this bill intended to make it an offence to approach a workplace with the intention of causing a fear, risk or hazard. You can be fined as a corporation up to $100,000 or as an individual up to fifty grand. obstructing a person entering or leaving the workplace up to twenty grand. endangering the safety of or interfering with equipment up to fifty grand, or imprisonment or both. Workplace Health and Safety Bill was introduced to protect demonstrations but would limit protesters from blocking entry and exit to workplaces. 50 grand for a corporation, sorry, 100 grand for a corporation, 50 grand for an individual, or obstructing a person, 20 grand. Um, another amendment to the same protection from protesters bill in 2019 oh yep related to the brown decision um so those were five thousand dollars for uh impeding the carrying out of a business and a threat to impede so that's tasmania victoria oh my god victoria is going to be huge
pretty sure Dan the man made a lot of rules in Victoria so substantial, substantial forest and timber okay that's preventing um, forestry protests and logging protests Commonwealth Games same as um, the event protests that we've already discussed substantial forests and wildlife again no logging protests and no wildlife protests summary offences giving police more power failure to give name failure to give name and address you can be fined up to a thousand dollars contravening an exclusion order imprisonment for two years no fine straight to prison do not pass go do not collect a hundred dollars in Western Australia some corporations like Woodside Mine um, people who are upset with environmental activists and so on are using slap suits to intimidate people who would like to protest um, this caused the Western Australian government to attempt to create new offences including preventing a lawful activity and possessing a thing for the purpose of preventing a lawful activity what the hell's a thing needless to say a thing was just a little bit too broad and it got smacked down and never passed into law I'm not sure about any other WA legislation involved with protesting but I'm sure whatever state you live in you'll do the responsible thing and look it up before you go and protest because even though you just attended a protest doesn't mean you're not liable doesn't mean that the people that organized the protests didn't use electronic devices to organize the protest if you were contacted in the method that the federal government deems illegal to organize a protest you are still liable even though you didn't organize the protest because that's the way you were contacted and that's how you went to the protest to wrap this all up the main point I'm trying to make here is that when lawmakers use ambiguous language or loose wording to enact a law that restricts your freedom, you need to be hyper vigilant. You need to understand what the law is that they're trying to impose and make sure that they're defining things directly and not just ambiguously like we've just discussed throughout this video. As the residents of Canton are starting to realise, this is not just applicable to laws involved with protesting. This is also applicable to just a general laws like witness intimidation, which can be used in other contexts because it's so loosely worded. It doesn't address the act that it's trying to prevent directly. And so if I was an activist in Canton, that's what I'd be aiming to focus on. I'd be using all of these examples of everyone who's been arrested, put them all together into one basket, and then present that to the ALCU as a group, and try to get some of the language in that law corrected. You have a lot more liberties than we do. You know, we have to rely on human rights law, which America is not a signatory to, but you do have a Bill of Rights and a far more comprehensive constitution and the ACLU is tapped into that information. I believe they'll at least hear you out because they heard you out when it came to the protest zone that Auntie Bev instituted. But I dare say that there are other lawyers out there who are way more knowledgeable on how it works in America than I am. But that is my suggestion. Deal with it now before it becomes an issue in more and more legislation. If you let it go once, they're just going to keep doing it. So stay vigilant and stay on the attack so that that doesn't happen.